Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today, we're going to continue our series through the book of James, looking today at James 4, 11 through 17, and pride and humility. Would you please pray with me now? Father, we thank you for your word, that it's living and active, that it penetrates into our hearts, and that Uh, that you know our hearts and that you search them and you know the motivations of them. And Lord, we we pray today as we consider this text that that you would bring conviction. Lord, uh, so often we are proud and we lack humility. And so I pray that you would humble us under your mighty hand, that we would see our great need for you, and that would cause us to recognize the many ways in which we are proud and which we boast and we rest not in your perfect righteousness but in our own sufficiency so lord help us to learn and grow and to discover more of your word and to learn from it in jesus name amen well if you have your bibles go ahead and open them to james 4 11 through 17 james 4 11 through 17 Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your your neighbor? Come now, you say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there, and trade, and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is the reading of God's holy precious word in our previous study we we saw in james 4 10 the 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 climax or or one of the main goals of this epistle and james says this in james 4 10 <coughs> humble yourselves before the lord and he will lift you up we have so much reason to be humble that that we shouldn't even have a problem with it Vanity and pride lead to foolish deeds. Suppose a proud man goes skiing. It's been years since his last run, and even at a at his peak, his skills were only modest. And yet, his friends easily talk him into starting on a difficult slope right away. Pride keeps him from admitting his own limitations. We have many reasons to be humble and can profit by listing them. And yet, if you read James four carelessly, it seems that uh. Yeah, carelessly, it seems that James drops the topic of humility. In the next paragraphs, he condemns the sins of slander, false judgment, overconfident business plans, indifference to God's will, and oppression of the poor. And at first glance, James seems to be taking up a string of social sins in no particular order. And yet, if we read closely, and we should always read God's word closely, connections to humility emerge. And we see that James follows his summons to humility with a warning against several sins of arrogance, against attitudes that contradict gospel humility. In fact, that's what we're going to look at. First, sins against gospel humility. The first sins, slander, and the judgment of others are acts of pride. When we judge and when we condemn others, we appoint ourselves to a position over and above them. But what gives us the right to promote ourselves to that rank? Indeed, to take the post of judge is to usurp the role that belongs to the judge of the universe, God himself. And so James asks us, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
And second, anyone who says what James says in James 4.13, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, surely suffers from pride. Anyone who says that his travels and his business ventures will prove successful presumes that he is the master of his faith, the commander of his own destiny. That is pride. See, God is the Lord of history. We are not. James questions a self-appointed master of history in verse 14, which says, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Third, it ought to humble us when we know the good and fail to do it. Fourth, looking to the next paragraph, James 5, 1 through 6, warns the rich against oppressing the poor. Oppression is a form of pride. And that is a sin, since rich oppressors place themselves above a law that requires us to treat others with justice. Oppressors, guided by envy and ambition, try to keep everything for themselves, even if they must defraud and oppress the poor to do so. Now notice that James treats these sins even more sharply as he goes along. He begins with the blunt command, Brothers, do not slander, in verse 11. But soon he abandons his custom of calling his readers brothers. Next he says, Now listen, you who say, in verse 13. The last section begins, Now listen, you rich people, in James 5.1. James also puts deflating questions to his readers in verse 12 and verse 14. Would say this, Who are you to judge, and what is your life? And so this section continues to explore themes that James opened in James 3.13-4.4. through 4, 4. He opposes the arrogance that illustrates the wisdom from the world, a wisdom that envies God's position as ruler of all. And because arrogance questions God's claim on the world, it's a form of friendship with a world that constantly questions God's claims. And now in each section of our passage, James notes that people forget their weakness and therefore forget their reason for humility. Each section raises a question. And the question to each one reminds us who we are and where we fit in the world. James 4.12 says, Who are you to judge your neighbor? That is, do you have what it takes to judge humanity? Verse 14, what is your life? And since you're no more than a mist on a lake, since you cannot even guarantee our existence for one day, even one moment, can you really declare what will happen in the future? Have you such a command of history? And the last question is implicit. If you know what you ought to do, why don't you do it? The next section, James 5, 1 through 6, asks the rich another question. Do you think that you can secure your wealth? If you would grow richer by defrauding the poor, can you preserve your plunder? Remember, God hears the cry of the oppressed. The sins of arrogance are ever more public too. James begins with a personal speech that slanders and judges a, 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 a brother or a neighbor. And next, he confronts the, the public boasting that launches public projects. And finally, he indicts the systematic corruption of economic and judicial systems that allow the rich to defraud the poor with impunity. In each section, James reminds us of a relevant principle of theology, a statement about God's strength that balances his remark about human frailties. In verse 12, he's talking about humans past judgment, but God is a judge. He can save or destroy. In verse 15, he says humans make plans, but God determines the progress of our plans. He even sets the span of our days. In James 5, 4 through 5, James's point is that humans may just mistreat their workers, but God, the Lord of hosts, hears the cry of the laborers. He will judge the oppressors. And these are the themes of our passage. And yet our passage fits within a larger section running from James 3, 3 to 5, 6. And in this section, James says there are two approaches to life. There's two worldviews. Each particular deed flows from a heart commitment, a perspective on life. Either we serve God or we serve self. We either live by his word or by the principle of arrogance. And notice that James suspects that some in his audience are not Christians. Until now, he has almost called his readers brothers. But now he questions some of his readers. He, he calls them, you who say, in verse 13, and you rich people, in James 5.1. And yet, even if we're innocent of the boasting that James describes, 
any one of us may forget our own weakness and God's greatness. And so let us have a proper view of God and a proper humble view of ourselves. And we, we should all consider the sins of pride and their remedy. Next, let's consider slander and judgment. Brothers, do not slander one another, James adds in verse 11, saying, anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. And so we see again that James has an ear for the sins of speech. And slander is a sin that fits the discussion of ambition. Slander is a way to promote oneself, a way to elevate oneself, to defeat a rival. And so James forbids slander. In fact, the word literally means to speak against another. It, it might either mean to speak against someone truly or to speak evil falsely. To gossip is to take a true story where it should not go. To slander is to create and to spread false stories. Both gossip and slander are sins and they cause real harm to our relationships and to our churches. And here James seems to warn about slander, false charges, not gossip, which are true charges made in the wrong court. And the reason is, is that James' word, kataleo, translates slander in the NIV or speak evil in the ESV. It appears as, alongside another term that means gossip in the New Testament, vice lists, such as in Romans 1.30 and 2 Corinthians 12.20. Slander begin, it belongs, I should say, in the same family of sin as gossip, even if they differ slightly. But James quickly shifts from slander to the sin of judgment. Judgment can mean false condemnation of the innocent or improper condemnation of those who are truly guilty. We know what is wrong with false condemnation, but what is wrong with judgment of the actual sins of others? James says this in James 4, 11 through 12. And when you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor, he says in James 4, 11 through 12. James says the one who judges his brother judges the law. It's not immediately obvious what this means, but why does James oppose judgment? Well, judgments are necessary at times. Scripture requires leaders to discern or to judge when a punitive disciple commits a sin and refuses to repent. In that case, a supposed disciple must be put out of the church after the process of church discipline. Leaders must likewise judge when a teacher is guilty of such an error or propounds a falsehood that he must be confronted and possibly pronounced a false prophet and put out of the assembly. Finally, Jesus knew judgment is sometimes necessary, and thus he told his disciples in John 7, 24, Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. But James says, There is no need to judge the words or deeds of another. We should attend to ourselves. That is Jesus' point at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 1 and 3, 3 and verse 5, which says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is not simply uttering a general principle here. He knows that those who hear his teaching will be tempted to judge others, to point out how they have failed. He says, do not do it. Don't criticize others. Attend to yourself. Now, consider how dangerous it is to uh, attend a marriage seminar alone. Going alone changes the way a man listens. He may rejoice over his wife. He may examine himself. But sadly, we're prone to dwell on the counsel the speaker had for our spouse, who, quote unquote, really needed to hear it. And reporting on the conference, we say, you should have been there, honey. The speaker suggested three ways for me to be a better husband and 19 ways for you to be a better wife. Let me share a few with you now. Friends, that's not going to go over well at all. Trust me. Preachers fear that the same principle is at work when someone greets them at the door after church and says, great sermon. I just wish my friend Zelda had been there. She sure needs it. This prompts some preachers to wonder silently, yes, but were you here for it? Well, judgment is also risky, Paul says, because if anyone should judge another, the same standard will be applied to them. 
Anyone who knows God's standards well enough to judge another by them also knows them well enough to be judged by them. And when we violate the standards we enforce, we are without excuse. If we hope to receive mercy, we ought to show mercy. We ought to be gracious. And James specifically forbids that brothers slander each other. The choice of address is apt, for we must often accuse family, husband, wife, brother, sister, a parent, and even children. We, we also criticize fellow Christians and fellow laborers. Defamation of our brothers involves other sins too. Slanders do not love. They are not humble. Slanders appoint themselves to a position of superiority. To judge a brother is to deny that he is your peer. The judge exalts himself and diminishes his neighbor, for only superiors judge their inferiors. This is what James has in mind when he says a slanderer speaks against the law and judges it. Everyone has felt the sting of misplaced criticism. Someone reproaches our manners, our clothing, our organization, our ideas, maybe even our theology. The censure may even be half right. What gives him the right to judge me? We sense that the critic lacks humility and, and exalts himself over others. And worse, the judge thinks he enforces the law while he actually violates it. The critic speaks against the law and judges it. James 4.11 says in two ways. First, he violates the law of love. Second, he picks and chooses among its commands, deciding which to obey and which to disregard. And, and when he disregards the law of love, he judges the law, saying, in essence, I need not obey the laws that require love and that give all people roughly equal status before God. And when we pick which command to obey and which to ignore, we insult God's person. For his commands are not arbitrary decrees. All of God's commands express his nature and all suit us perfectly. Every single one tells us how to govern ourselves so that we become more like him. To reject God's law is to reject the Lord and to enthrone ourselves. But, but God is the one lawgiver and judge. He is the one who can save and destroy. We have no right to declare that another person is ripe for condemnation. Judgment can begin at the ground level, go to hell, or a trivial level, your, your clothes clash. Social behavior of parties can create tension between men and women. A husband accuses his wife, you, you told that story poorly, you completely botched the punchline of your joke. The wife replies, if I botched the line, why did everyone laugh? The wife thinks her husband has bad manners. You put your elbows on the table tonight, she says. He replies, they weren't my elbows, they, they were my forearms. Besides, real men don't read Miss Manners. And they, don't, and they do put their elbows on the table if they please. And even if these little exchanges are jovial, we must ask ourselves, did anyone appoint me to be the police of manners? The, the police of storytelling? God is the one judge. Without his mercy, we would all suffer condemnation. Because of Christ's work, he is willing to save and not destroy. And since we have received mercy, not judgment, we should show mercy, not judgment. We should not talk down to others. We, we should calm down to meet their needs. And if there is a need, we should meet it, not broadcast it. So much judgment involves a decision to take a position of superiority above another, to dominate them, to force them to our view. Envy and ambition, the sins that most contradict Humility, cause, slander, and judgment. Next, let's consider boastful ambition and presumptuous planning. Boastful ambition and presumptuous planning. As he so often does, James gets at the sin of presumption through our speech. He says, come now, in verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year in trade and make a profit. And now James says such speech is presumptuous and arrogant. It presumes that we will live as long as we please. It presumes that we can make whatever plans we please. We can go today or tomorrow. The choice is ours. It presumes that we have the capacity to execute whatever plan we conceive. We declare that we will make a profit. This way of thinking forgets three things. It forgets our ignorance. We think we can plan a year in advance and come and go as we please, but we do not even know what tomorrow will bring. It forgets our frailty, James 4.14 says. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a myth that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We think we can master our destiny, that we are the commander of our faith, but our lives are as insubstantial and fleeting as the morning mist that appears and disappears in hours. Many of us 
have spent time at a lake in the summer. If the nights grow cool, there will always be mist on the lake in the morning at sunrise. The beauty of the sunrise on a lake is a treasure. But by mid-morning, the mist is always gone. The Lord says that by the standards of eternity, our lives are as mist. And presumptuous planning also forgets uh, our dependence on God. Our frailty and ignorance lead to the conclusion that we should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. Verse 15 tells us, and we may still say, we'll do this or that, but James says we must have a preface, if the Lord wills. And although Jesus had more clarity than we can ever have, he modeled this spirit in Gethsemane facing the cross. He says in Matthew 26, 42, your will be done. Paul modeled the same thing when he journeyed to Jerusalem where he knew that he would suffer harm. He went where he had to go and he said in Acts 21, 14, the Lord's will be done. And yet it's still good to say and to make plans. The Bible commends the ant for gathering food in the summer to guarantee a supply in the winter. Godly leaders often sense a God-given mission. The Bible commends Moses for planning to lead his people out of Egypt. God blesses Joshua for planning to lead Israel into Canaan. Paul rightly planned to take the gospel to places where Christ Jesus had never been preached. The saints don't hesitate to say, I will, or even we will. And some prefer life goals. Others prefer, prefer five-year plans. Still, still others prefer a close script for the next one or two year plan and think anything more is like a whole week of weather forecasts so loose and uncertain they are more like entertaining uh, than informative but god never censures our planning planning is entirely proper as long as we confess that god is sovereign and we are frail we are ignorant we're depending on him the phrase lord willing is not a magical incantation it does not ensure our humility, but the suffice, if the Lord wills, is helpful. It reminds us that our plans, even our lives, are frail in the midst. And so we plan. We hope that God will use the process that our aspirations match his purposes. In fact, to refuse to plan may be a sign of sloth. It's easier to drift along with adequate food and funds, doing what others want, taking whatever comes along, hardly troubling over the future, as long as we have enough food and enough fun. But the Lord expects us to do more than take whatever pleasures that the day affords. Sadly, James says much of our planning is boastful or even arrogant. He says in verse 16, As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. The boaster forgets God. He thinks he's the master of history, the, the master of fate, the master and the commander of his soul. He presumes he can trade and make money whenever he, he does not even know if he will be alive tomorrow. Such planning manifests ambition for wealth. Since trade was the way to become wealthy in the first century, people purchased land to stay wealthy. The desire to get rich and to spend it on our own pleasures is a sign of the sin of envy that James forbids. But there are humble ways to plan. First, planners dedicate their plans to the Lord. A business uh, person might say, I could retire, but, but I am working a few more years because I hope to have more to give to a Christian cause that I believe in. That is the kind of planning that is right. The man had a plan in order to accumulate capital. He had a level of humility about his plan. He said, I hope. And he planned to use his wealth for the kingdom and not for himself. Second, planners confess their, their need for the favor of God. Humble planners know that, that we can do everything right and still fail. We can buy a farm uh, before a drought. We can buy an insurance firm right before a catastrophe. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Psalm 127, verse 1. We cannot even live unless God sustains us. And so this is why James says in James 4, 15, if the Lord wills, we will, do, we will live and we will do this or that. And third, Planners confess that whatever they achieve is through the gift and the favor of God. Some men inherit a, a thriving business from their earthly fathers, but, but we are all heirs of God's generosity. If we, if we do accomplish something notable, we can ask certain questions to instill humility. If a woman is intelligent, did she earn it or did she inherit it? If a man is an athlete, did he construct his muscle fibers? If a woman is a great singer, did, did she engineer her vocal cords? 
If filled with energy, did, did a man choose his metabolism? If, it, if experienced, who earned the attention of his first mentor? The achiever may think, but I have worked hard to hone my skills, perhaps so. But even then we need to ask if God did not guide our desires and nudge us towards godly aspirations. And so let us be ever humble. Let us rejoice in the goodness of God and let us use our gifts for him. Next, let's consider our failure of duty, our failure of duty from James 4, 17. The last sentence of James 4 seems like an isolated statement in verse 17. He says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. In fact, it links the section of proud plans to the section on abuse of the poor. We should always do what we know. As James likes to say, James is telling us not to forget God in our daily lives. As you plan, remember to say, Lord willing, as you consider those who work for you, remember to treat them well by paying them fairly and promptly. God sees you and protects them, even if no one else does. And yet there's one more thing. We can never fully do the good we ought. If we have nothing beyond these commandments, James will drive us to despair. And therefore, we must remember the promise James so recently made in James 4.10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humility is a way of the Lord Jesus. If we remember that he humbled himself by taking on human flesh and enduring all the troubles that attend to human life. Above all, he humbled himself by dying on the cross. And yet, that supreme act of self-denial led to his supreme glory when God raised him from the dead and crowned him with great honor. And thus, when James says, Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up, he bids us to come and follow the path of Christ. James says that anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins in verse 17. And since we cannot simply know to do the good, no matter how well we do it, we must humbly ask the Lord to lift us up. His grace does lift every penitent sinner who comes to him. The path of the gospel is a path of humility. There is a path of meekness and a peace or, or path of ambition and grasping. There is a way of peace or a way of striving. There is a way of repentance and conversion or a way of arrogance and pride. James is bidding us to the path of gospel humility. You know, friends, it begins with seeing ourselves right. It begins, humility begins with seeing ourselves rightly before God. It's like Isaiah in Isaiah 6. He recognized he is in the presence of a holy God. And he says in Isaiah 6, 5, he is a man of unclean lips. He recognizes who he is in light of the Lord. That is critical. Critical. Absolutely essential. If we are going to be humble, we as God's people need to remind ourselves that, that we, ha uh, we belong to Christ. And, and even remind ourselves, in, in the Old Testament, uh, the, 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 the nation of Israel did not have 24-7 unfettered access before the throne of grace. And now because of the blood and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have 24-7 access before the throne of grace. This should humble us. Humble us. It should humble us. We should be humble. We should recognize not only that, that who we are in light of, of God, God is, is all-knowing. He, he sees all. He knows all. Um, he knows the, the thoughts and the motivations of our hearts. But in, in the light of that, we should be humble. Calvin, uh, following Augustine, is right. Uh, said that the Christian life is humility. 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 If we truly understand our, our great need of Christ and, our, and, our, and, our, and a great Christ for our need, as Spurgeon said, then, then guess what? We will be humble. We, we cannot help but be humble. We, we should be growing in humility as we grow in the Christian life. Uh, humility is not an opponent of the Christian life. It is at the heart of the Christian life. It's the reason why Jesus humbled himself in service to others. You, you think of that great towel uh, sequence, that great uh, sequence in the Gospels, where Jesus is teaching them about what true servant leadership is all about. It, it was a humble thing for him to humble himself as the Son of God and the Son of Man 
to wash the the, the dirty feet uh, uh, of his of his disciples. It should have been the other way around, right? It should have been the disciples who were humbly serving Christ, but Christ was showing them and illustrating to them the heart of what it means to be a servant of Christ. And it's the path of humility. Yeah, lots of people want to make a great impact for the Lord. They they want to be greatly used by the Lord. But the question is, are, are you ready to be humble? You know, one of the things uh, that I pray for every day is, is not only that I'd be faithful to the Lord, that I'd be focused on what he's called me to do, but also that I would be humble, that I would be humble. And this kind of humility is is a is, should be the posture of our hearts. And it, and it will show in how we respond to difficult people. It'll it'll show in the midst of conflict. It'll it'll show itself in the midst of of, of us uh, being criticized and and a whole number of things. And all of that shows whether we are humble, whether and what humility shows is whether we truly understand who we are and whose we belong to. And this is a reminder for all of us. We all struggle with humility because we all, whether we recognize it or not, struggle with pride. And that's why we have Christ. That's why we have Christ. He is enough for us and he always will be. He was tempted, Hebrews 2, 17 through 18, in every way. And yet, what did he not do? He did not sin. He's unlike us. And that's why we, he can meet our need. He is that sinless substitute, that, that per, the Lord, our righteousness. He's the only one who can forgive us. He's the only one who can sustain us. He's the only one who can secure us. He's the, because he's the one who's adopted us. Because he's the one who justified us. Because he's the one who is conforming us into the image of Christ and for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the perfect, spotless righteousness of Christ without which we would have no hope. And in a world that desperately needs hope, in a, in a world that desperately needs to see examples of what humility looks like, Lord, may we be the first ones to repent. May we be the first ones to lead in our homes in repentance. And may we be the first ones as men to lead in humility. And may we pray, Lord, for you to create in us as Psalm 51 says, a new heart, uh, to, to renew our, our minds according to Romans 12, 1 through 2, uh, with the word of God and by the spirit of God. So Lord, I, I pray if, if we lack humility today, may we ask even our spouse, do we lack humility? Where, where do you see me being prideful? Lord, help us to walk in humility. Help us to walk in the path that you would have for us the path of servant, gospel-centered humility and service to others that, it, that, that shows that, that we take seriously the, the very nature and the purpose of Christ to come and to ransom his own, to come on a, on a, on, on a sentence of death, on a death sentence, to pay the ultimate penalty in our place and for our sin, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be washed new in and because of the blood of Christ and because of the resurrection of our Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for your grace that you that you give to us every moment, that you even continue to pour out. As Paul says in Ephesians 1, it superabounds towards your people. So, Lord, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your grace is sufficient to me, all of our need, and, and it always will be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.